I'm going to be talking to David Coletto, who is the CEO of Abacus Data, about a recent publication that he authored uh, entitled Economic Anxiety in Public Policy, a guide to understanding your audiences today for business policy and political leaders. Now, before we get to David, I want to encourage you to connect with uh, Energy Media and me on social media. You should see the uh, our handles on the screen. And especially, I'd like to invite those who enjoy being annoyed uh, on a regular basis. That seems to be my role in the energy conversation in Canada these days. So welcome to the interview, David. Thanks for having me, Mark. I'm good to see you. Likewise. This is a very, very, uh, well, I'd almost call it a, a seminal study. So I'm going to leave it open to you uh, to start with uh, an overview study. Kind of give us the broad strokes here. So, you know, I was really um, inspired uh, to, to, to look at a data set that is almost eight months old. So, so the data that, that I uh, used to, to, to do this analysis came from a survey we did back in July of 2021 for uh, the Broadbent Institute and, and, a, and a national public sector union looking at economic anxiety, affordability, tax fairness, and so on. Uh, but obviously, the, the occupation and convoy protests really had me thinking about more, more clearly, I think, about some of the divisions. And, and obviously, you know, your, your interview with Frank Graves and the work that Frank has done on, on you know, um, ordered and open kind of uh, perspectives, uh, other work on polarization wanted it forced me to kind of reflect on the fact that I am one of the group of people who probably see the world differently um, and that's affecting the way we make decisions. And so I, I took this large data set of 1500 adult Canadians from a representative sample and ran what, what we in polling and public opinion call a segmentation analysis that, that looked at the dynamics of how people are feeling economically their views about big public policy questions, their, the role that they view government has, and in a way to simplify it, uh, created for this, this, this statistical analysis created four groups. Um, now it's a very simplified way of looking at the country. There's more division and, and diversity than four groups, but I think for the purposes of understanding audiences, it, this, this is a, 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 an easier way. And we basically got four groups. Um, two groups that I describe as anxious, economically anxious at the high level of a, of a scale. But one of those groups uh, on the progressive side or the left side of the spectrum, representing about a quarter of the population, a similar group who are anxious but are more conservative, small c conservative, um, or on the right of the spectrum that are about one out of five Canadians, so slightly smaller. Um, you have a larger group that I describe as being secure middle, meaning they're far more um, economically secure perceptually, and they have mixed views on the role of government and, and on some big policy questions. And then lastly, uh, a, a small group representing 13% of the population, what I call progressive professionals. Right. Let me just put some numbers to the other groups. We've got anxious progressives at 27% of Canadians, anxious uh, conservatives at 21%, secure middle at 39%, and of course, progressive professionals at 13%. Now, one of your takeaways, uh, David, is uh, uh, increasing alienation between those who influence decisions, business policy and media, and those who consume those decisions. What do you mean by that? So, you know, not all of you know, the editors at, at major news organizations and all CEOs of major companies and all the deputy ministers and elected officials in Ottawa and provincial capitals are in the progressive professional group. But I think most are. Um, and when you look at how they view the world about how they've experienced the pandemic as an example and how they view the future, they, are, they stand in stark contrast to the other three groups, which represent 87% of the population. So if the folks making the decisions, influencing those decisions, and reporting on those decisions are very different from everybody else, um, that might be contributing. I'm not saying it's the cause, but it might be contributing to some of the polarization and the division that we, I think, are all experiencing and perceiving to experience across the country right now. Now, one of the things you did in this piece is you said uh, you confess that you are a progressive, uh, a progressive professional, and I will confess that I am one as well. I, and, and I can tell you 
you know, my, most of my reporting is around the energy transition, uh, which is deeply disruptive for many people in Canada, well, and globally. Uh, but in my opinion, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, when we've electrified much of the economy, uh, I have a very rosy view of that future. And I know that doesn't accord with a lot of people, particularly in Alberta and Saskatchewan where you had, would have a lot of anxious conservatives. So what do we make of that? The fact that people like you and me are disconnected from the majority of Canadians. Well, I think just on that point about understanding where the world is going and not feeling insecure about that is what is one of the key differentiators between that group of progressive professionals, which I've termed, it's, it's only my uh, nomenclature there, and everybody else. So 87% of those who are in that tiny group of you and I, Markham, uh, say they look at the, where the economy is going and see more opportunities than threats, 87%, almost all of them. On the flip side, um, no other group in which a majority view that, and among those who are anxious, large majorities, either 72% among the anxious uh, progressives or 90% among the anxious conservatives actually say they see more threats than opportunities in the future. And so when you talk about the energy economy as an example of that, and you are someone who's maybe working in the oil sands or working in Calgary and um, feeling anxious about your future, um, and you're being told, oh, don't worry, things are gonna be great, there'll be lots of jobs for you, that is a, that's a, that's a sharp conflict. Um, and, and that I think is explaining some of, again, those divisions that are only getting stronger because we're saying, we keep saying, no, 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 lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities. And they're saying, no, no, but I feel incredibly insecure about where I am today and where it's going. Uh, I'd like to address that actually, because I've had a little experience pre-pandemic when I actually could get out and share a room with, with other folks. And what I found I ex in my book launch, for instance, in 2019, when I was in Alberta and I went to a lot of book signings and talked to folks who were in both political camps, you know, sort of the NDP and, and conservative. And one of the things I found uh, is that when you engage with people personally and you get to explain things in some detail and some nuance and explain why that, uh, you know, I might be optimistic about the energy future, you get a much more positive response than when you're just you know, trying to do it through the, the media, of, you know, of a television or radio interview or something that you've, you've written. Uh, would that be a, a generalization that we, you know, more, would be more broadly applicable? Well, no, I, I think so. I think it's, you know, we always start how we consume. I, one of the things I've been fascinated as, as, as a researcher is, is the filters we put on ourselves unknowingly, unconsciously, based either on our partisanship, based on our identities, right? So if you are, um, you know, I'm not an Albertan, but I spent four years there. I married an Albertan. There are strong identities attached to being an Albertan. And so that means you have to believe in the oil and gas sector. You have to um, see yourself as kind of the, uh, you know, red, the black swan of, of confederation and, and have to go kind of a, a different direction. Even if when you, I ask you in survey questions, uh, certain questions that are actually very similar to the rest of the country, that identity drives you. And so when you're having conversations with somebody, those identities can break down because it's more about a relationship and it's more personal and, and intimate. But in a setting where you're listening to the prime minister who you think is a natural threat to you, you're not really going to listen. And so um, the world we now communicate in has made it even harder for us to, to break through those filters and those barriers and um, creates the situation where it's, it's very hard to con convince and persuade anybody anymore uh, of of a, of a worldview that that conflicts with their own. Yeah, my takeaway from this is is that the progressive uh, uh, the progressive uh, that uh, progressive professionals that you and I belong to need to engage in a different way with the with uh, the rest of Canada. Uh, but your second point or your second takeaway is that we can't assume that a politician like Pierre Poilievre, uh, the CPC or Donald Trump, can't find widespread support in, in Canada. A lot of, you know, they take advantage of these uh, kinds of anxieties. And you can see it, especially in Poilievre's uh, uh, campaign since he decided to run for the leadership of the CPC. Uh, what do we make of that? I think there's two things. I mean, his natural audience in my segmentation would be the anxious conservatives, right? Because he's speaking to the fact that they feel um, um, very uh, uh, insecure about 
their economic and, and social future, right? So they're far more likely to say that the pandemic um, has, made it, has made their stress and anxiety around money worse. Uh, they think inequality is, is up. They think the system's rigged uh, against them. But at the same time, he's also speaking to that secure middle group who wanna protect that security, who, who feel secure, but are not so secure that they're willing to take big risks or can't be persuaded by someone who says, if we continue to go down this path, um, you know, we are gonna see major consequences to our, our, our livelihoods and, and, and our ability to, to make ends meet. And, and so that, that's the power of his, of his rhetoric and his, of his narrative that he's trying to tell. And the instant reaction of the progressive professionals, people like me, is to reject that, is to say, Pierre, you're not describing the world as it is. But what he's doing is describing the world as people see it. So we can't just discount it because we often will come off as, as condescending. And that just further strengthens um, those arguments. And so he's, he's taking advantage of, of, a, of, a, of a mindset in many people's minds um, that, that's, that's the creation of these, these con of, of these events. And that's why I think he's, if I had to make a wager, will win the leadership of the Conservative Party and you can't discount the fact that he could actually become prime minister. Yeah, when you talk about how people perceive, uh, you know, these progressive professionals like you and I as condescending, it's like you're reading my Facebook, the comments on my Facebook uh, page. Uh, look, so let's talk about, about folks like us, the progressive professionals, and how are we going to reconnect with the, the people who are anxious and people who don't share our optimism for the future? I think the first step is to recognize our bias at the door um, and to know that we do have different views um, and that those views um, affect the way we communicate and the way that they hear us. So that's the first step. And that's as a researcher is usually where kind of my advice stops is to sort of describe the world and, and understand it. But the second is then to, to, to understand who these groups trust, right? Um, who do they rely on? And why, why is that the case? If they don't trust certain groups or, or individuals or types of people than others, um, and then figure out why and, and start to change um, the way that we talk about it. I mean, here's an example. I'm, uh, I've always said for a long time that I don't think the prime minister talks enough about the cost of living. I don't think he talks about it enough that people are feeling insecure about it. He may not have all the policy tools to solve the problem, which is why maybe he's not talking about it. But we need political leaders who, and business leaders and media personalities and, and columnists who can empathize, who demonstrate empathy. That's what people want. And when I look at the last federal election, for example, and I ask people to describe the different party leaders, Justin Trudeau's, one of his worst performing attributes was this idea that he understood me. He understood what I was going through and cared enough about it to do something. And so for me, that's the first step is like empathy matters, compassion matters. And we too, we, we maybe too quickly rush to judge people for the views they hold as opposed to understanding it. Now, there are some views, frankly, I don't think we should emphasize with. If you're a racist, if you are outright calling for like um, certain people not to have certain rights, well, I don't know if we can really emphasize with that. But if we understand what might be driving that, sub, that next group, uh, the majority of those who are anxious, um, I think we can come a long way in, in trying to figure out how do we find common ground? Well, uh, this is very enlightening for me, I have to tell you, because uh, as you know, I spend a lot of time on social media, primarily Twitter and Facebook, and I have these kinds of conversations all the time, and I am not as empathetic as maybe I should be, and which is ironic in a way, because I grew up in a very blue collar household and and uh, didn't have a you know a privileged upbringing and to pay my way through university, oh, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I mean, I know where those people are coming from and I understand that anxiety, but I have not been as empathetic now that I think about it as I should have. And that maybe is preventing me from connecting with those folks so that my explanation of why we should be optimistic it, it hits deaf ears. Yeah, and I and I and my advice is, it's it's more it's 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 less important that we're empathetic to the leaders who are cheerleading kind of in you know these insecurities than the people who are being led by them. 
right? It's one thing to disagree fundamentally maybe with Donald Trump and say, I could never ever see the world the way he sees it. And I'm never gonna be able to, um, I don't wanna even talk to him. I don't even wanna, you know, not that we have the opportunity to talk to Donald Trump, but you know what I mean? But it's another thing to say, I'm gonna write off 50% of the United States because they voted for him. Um, and, and that's where I think we have to draw sort of a distinction and, and doing so gets us to a point where we can then start engaging in a way that doesn't alienate us from these audiences. Because again, the whole point of this piece was to remind everybody that us, those people who have the privilege of being able to influence opinions and having these platforms um, likely have very different perspectives and actually lived experiences. And so we need to keep that in mind um, when we talk about anything really. Well, let's talk about that anxiety in a little bit more detail, David. So, okay, I understand cost of living, job might be there, might not be there, uh, you know, can't pay the mortgage, can't put food on the table. But do you have a list of like the top three or four uh, factors that are causing this anxiety? Well, I think one of them is, is there, there's, there's, I think, a few, a few dimensions. One is, is the basic idea that there's a large number of Canadians and Americans and you name it across the developed world who are looking ahead and saying um, the world's changing really quickly and that change is, is very threatening to me um, either because it's demographic change right I'm seeing people around me looking less and less like me um, whether it's economic change whether it's um, political or social change right all of those are, are, are there and so there's a and this is the work that Frank Graves does, and, and many academics in the US are looking at this, is, is there's a personality trait in many who, who look at change and um, see, it as a, a, see it threatening and want to protect themselves from it, right? There are others who love change, who want you know, to experience new things, who seek out those. Um, this book called Prius or Pickup by two American political scientists, I, I highly recommend reading. Um, and they describe them as fixed or fluid, similar to Frank Graves is open and, and, and ordered. And those fluids love to travel to new places, love to eat new things off a menu, and they also are open to experiencing the change that's happening in their lives. So that's one. The second, I think, factor is simply believing that government isn't delivering, right? If you look at those who are anxious, particularly the anxious conservatives, not only do they feel that the system more generally is rigged, and they're the ones, they agree with anxious progressives. Like you could get half of the country in the room who may disagree fundamentally on the role of government, but they both agree that income inequality is rising, that the, the, the tax system's unfair, um, but then disagree the government can solve for it. And that is, I think, related to being just simply let down and disappointed. And you know, there was a moment during this pandemic where Canadians actually agreed that government was doing good things. As the pandemic went on, that started to fray um, as, as it seemed we, we had lost control. So trust in government and institutions is critical, as is um, a sense of, of security about the future. One of the sources of this anxiety, uh, in my opinion, uh, David, is the fact that the energy transition is fundamentally restructuring the economy. I mean, we're to, I mean, take a look at the auto industry. You know, when you go from manufacturing internal combustion engines to manufacturing EVs and batteries and all of the things that go into, into modern uh, transportation, it's, it's pretty fundamental. And it has, uh, and there are big ripples of that all through the economy. You don't have to be in the energy, uh, you know, economy to be affected by it. And I think that, dis and I often describe the 2020s as the disruptive decade of this energy transition. With, I mean, you, you don't have, I think it's self-evident that it's disruptive. We can feel it. We can see it every day. And I, and I try to explain that to folks, but I can see where in my own reporting, my own journalism, it's not, not just the insights, it's the empathy to connect with the audience so that they accept those insights. Would you agree that's a reasonable observation? I would. I think it's, it's a really, I think, insightful way of looking at, you know, the, the level of disruption that's going to be required, actually, to get there. Um, means that we have to understand and, and bring people along. Um, you know, I don't know if this is where you were going with, 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 with this thought, but, you know, just in the last few days, I've thought more about how unprepared we actually are 
to bring the population along through this transition, right? We are at a time now where gas prices, maybe by the spring in, in most jurisdictions in Canada will hit $2 a liter. And we just released data um, as we record this today from Clean Energy Canada that shows 80% of Canadians are open to buying an EV, right? But I was just in California, um, rented for the first time a, 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 and you had been driving a plug-in hybrid. I had no idea where I could charge it, how I could charge it. Um, and there, you know, and that's just a, a simple example. You're speaking about the bigger changes of people losing their jobs or feeling insecure. Um, that means that, 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 vol that volume of change, whether it's in what car I drive and where I'm going to fill it up or charge it to what am I going to do for my career? What am I going to do? What are my kids going to do if I've always lived in Northern Alberta or in Calgary um, is profound. And I don't, I honestly don't think our, our leaders generally are, are talking enough about it in a way that people understand and can, and can relate. And maybe we're not doing enough, frankly, to, to push this transition forward. Um, and so therefore people don't think it's gonna happen um, in, 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 in an appropriate way and they're just gonna get left behind. Well, let, let's wrap up this uh, a very interesting conversation, David. I think that we've touched on some very interesting points. But just before I, we came on this interview, I was wrapping up a column where, where I, I'm talking about the leadership in Alberta and, and particularly around oil and gas and optimists versus pessimists. Uh, and opt pessimists are actually more like me who think that the, the transition is coming quicker and Alberta is doing enough to, you know, the, the, it, the transition is going to hit Alberta oil and gas a lot quicker than the optimists uh, believe. And, and, I, and I make the point in the column that almost all of the energy leadership in Alberta has an unrealistic view of the energy transition. And then that kind of you know, maybe some cockiness or some arrogance or some, you know, belief in the status quo uh, kind of combines with the anxiety that they feel and creates this toxic brew, a uh, toxic political brew. Yeah, I mean, that, that, you know, that bias that we have towards the status quo um, it, it affects us all. But I've, I've seen in the polling we've done on, on energy issues and, and the transition more generally, to believe that the public is actually ahead of all our leaders, political leaders, uh, business leaders, and you're right, even most certainly in the oil and gas sector. Um, and so that means that there may come a point where, again, the public is ready uh, and willing, and, and yet they can't transition. But the moment they can, it, it may happen in, in a flood that, that you can't really slow down. And so that's, I'm watching for that, and I think it may come. And, and those businesses, those sectors that have prepared for it are going to be, and, and jurisdictions in the case of you, you talking about Alberta, um, are going to be much more prepared and, and benefit from, from that. Um, you know, there's still lots of, lots of questions. I, I will admit that, like, the, you know, um, from the public's perspective and the research I've done, but they're ready. Um, and, you know, it, it's not going to take a lot to, to move them if everything comes together. Well, David, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. And I look forward to this, you know, further interviews where we can explore this topic in greater detail. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Markham.